Good evening, good day, good morning to everyone. My name is Andrei Chicherin. I'm a head of innovation, technology transfer, and co-founding platforms team at the Green Climate Fund. And I'm glad to welcome you all at our session, Breakthrough Climate Innovations and Technology Transfer for a Developing Country. It is almost 11 p.m. in South Korea now, and the first good news that we can share today is that the weekend is already here and rapidly approaching Africa, Europe, and Americas. Another good news is that we have maybe more than eight hours to discuss climate innovation before Saturday night fever kicks in in other parts of the world. Joking. But I see some panel members are ready to discuss it for 80 hours. <laughs> but the greatest news, of course, that we have today is the members of our panel that will share today with all of us their knowledge and experience, so relevant and so important to learn from. Without further delay, let me hand it over to each of them with a brief introduction of themselves and their organizations. Dear Bunmi, over to you. Thank you, Andre. Bunmi Adekori, I represent Breakthrough Energy Ventures. Uh, we're technology investors uh, from a venture capital approach. Uh, we look at innovative technologies that can mitigate greenhouse gases. Uh, we have a target of mitigating about 500 million tons of CO2 per investment thesis that we pursue. Uh, we invest in a broad platform. We invest in agricultural, transportation, buildings, manufacturing, and um, um, electricity. Uh, we are uh, very active uh, uh, globally. Uh, a lot of our focus, however, is in North America and in Europe, um, uh, but we do extend um, to international markets as well. Thank you. The Americ. The floor is yours. Hi, everybody. Um, Merrick Kerr. I am uh, one of the founders um, of Energy Vault, a new uh, gravity based energy storage um, technology. Um, I run the commercial side of the business um, as we're looking to start deploying the technology um, starting very, very soon. Um, been involved in renewables since, oh, 2000, 2001 with wind, uh, then did renewable fuels uh, and solar, uh, and now obviously energy storage. So a lot of, uh, a lot of experience of what, what works and what doesn't work. So looking forward to the debate today. Thank you, Mary. Dear Jay, please go ahead. Thanks so much, Andre, and welcome to everyone that's tuning in. Uh, fantastic to be here. Really appreciate the chance to share some views with these uh, leading experts from around the world. My name is Jay Coe. I'm one of the co-founders and managing directors of the Lightsmith Group. We are the sponsors of the Climate Resilience and Adaptation Finance and Technology Transfer Facility Strategy, or CRAFT, which is the first private investment strategy focused on uh, climate resilience and adaptation. And so our strategy really is focused on companies that have technologies on the one hand, uh, including data analytics and intelligence and products and solutions on the other that actually can help address and assess the increasing risk and impact uh, from the effects of climate change that we're unfortunately seeing unfolding around the world, whether it's through wildfire, extreme weather events, disruption of the supply chain, healthcare impact, um, impact on the energy system, on the financial services system, and obviously on humanitarian um, concerns across the world. So we're focusing on areas that start with analytics, like agricultural analytics, supply chain analytics, catastrophe risk modeling and weather analytics, digital mapping and uh, geospatial imagery, but also areas like resilient food systems, water harvesting, drip irrigation, and water efficiency, and related areas that we think need to be scaled up because we think there's a tremendous opportunity for private investors, but also a tremendous need as the problem, unfortunately, of climate change accelerates over the next several decades. So it's wonderful to be here. I look forward to the conversation. Thank you, Jay. Dear Paul, your turn. Hi, good morning, good evening. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm Paul Needham. I'm a multi-time entrepreneur. Most recently, I, uh, I co-founded a venture in India that provides uh, rooftop solar leasing in rural areas. So we created a pay-as-you-go 
system with IoT technology integrated into the back of the solar panels so we could offer solar as a service and make it affordable to low income people in, uh, in rural villages, uh, households and small businesses. We sold that company to NG, the French uh, energy uh, giant. And uh, now I'm working on a number of projects, one of which is at the University of British Columbia, where we have recently launched the Climate Venture Studio, which is an incubator stream and uh, where we're focused on identifying breakthrough uh, climate solutions and accelerating those out into market. So our mission there is to build breakthrough climate ventures. I'm also a co-founder of Positive Capital Partners, which is an advisory firm uh, working with clients to help design and launch uh, climate solutions. And uh, I'll be talking today about uh, an initiative that we're working on there uh, in the energy markets. Thank you, Paul. And finally, Mr. Sobjin Chang. Thank you, Andre. Um, this is Sobjin Chang from Korea's Born to Global Center. Uh, we are a government uh, agency under the Korean Ministry of Science and ICT. And the, uh, the key purpose of our organization is to find, source, and grow deep tech companies and startups um, and send them globally. One of our key characteristics is that we don't choose any ordinary startups. We focus on selecting key deep tech, disruptive tech, and climate tech companies in Korea. We help them throughout their growth process, through our in-house consulting, and we send them overseas, trying to find partnerships uh, with other companies around the world. Um, the technical account issues that have been covered for the past two and a half days in this um, great conference, uh, Korea is experiencing the same things that other countries and other participants are experiencing, such as creating jobs, reducing inequality, strengthening resilience, and that has led us to focus even more on breakthrough, disruptive, and deep tech innovations in technology, and specifically in climate technology. We here at Born to Global Center believe that entrepreneurs, more specifically climate entrepreneurship or climate technopreneurship, as we call it, could be the key in resolving these problems pre, during COVID and post COVID. We agree that the climate tech incubators and accelerators are innovative vehicles. The question that we want to share with you and the answers that we want to share through our experience is how we are going to translate climate tech concepts into action and how we are going to enable uh, tech transfers between developed and developing countries. Thank you. Thank you, Sakji. Uh, dear members of the audience, before we move to the main part of our session, please let me remind you that a dedicated topic called GCF Project Idea Hub is opened at Vova app. So those of you who seek support for the innovative ideas and projects, please feel free to submit them as indicated in the description part of the topic. With that, let me ask Bumi my first question. Uh, dear Bumi, we know that you come from the venture capital and uh, active in the R&D stage of the project support. Can you provide some examples of innovative and climate related technologies from the portfolio of your company? You know, we strongly believe that technology has a, a very, very critical and important role to play in how we mitigate uh, greenhouse gases. Um, it is important to invest in breakthrough technologies, not just incremental technologies. Um, if you look at a lot of the investments we make, we really think of how do we get to carbon zero, um, not just uh, reduction of CO2, which is very important, but how do we actually uh, develop technologies that will give us a pathway to uh, bringing CO2 emissions to zero. Uh, we've done so in a variety of spaces. We've invested, as I mentioned earlier on, in agriculture, um, in electricity, um, um, in transportation, in buildings, in manufacturing, um, and, and, and in other sectors as well. Um, a great example of uh, one of the companies that we've backed is Commonwealth Fusion Science here in, uh, in Cambridge, Massachusetts, uh, which is a very new approach to atomic fusion. Um, if such technologies are successful, uh, it will be transformative for humankind, um, not just the energy 
um, sector, but the, the, the broader secondary effects of such a breakthrough technology will be very, very transformative. Uh, we've supported a company by the name of Pivot Bio um, in the agricultural space, which is developing an alternative to uh, uh, fertilizers uh, in a very carbon responsible fashion. Um, that kind of technology will have a transformative footprint on how we think about uh, ammonia-based fertilizers, uh, uh, for example. So we really believe in, in, in making a transformation. It's not just about the incremental um, technology development, but the transformative uh, technology development. And doing that in a venture context, you know, venture capitalists are, are comfortable with taking technical risks uh, particularly in this uh, um, uh, sector. Um, so, you know, the, the key thing is to develop transformative innovation. And that is what we're trying to do. And personally, when you were analyzing these technologies, did you ever experience something like, wow, this is a great idea that would really would sort of make me go extra mile doing something which I would not, well, uh, normally doing a standard operating procedure just to support it, just make it happen and finally succeed. Yes, I mean, we support early stage innovation and early stage innovation requires um, a lot of um, enterprise support. Um, oftentimes um, concepts are done by, you know, first time entrepreneurs, sometimes second time or serial entrepreneurs that are building teams that require venture capitalists that just uh, that bring more than capital to the table that bring additional support um, either in technical um, um, competence um, or in market competence um, so those are some of the things that uh, we think of when we look at our companies uh, in general our organization is a very thematic organization we have a very strong uh, technical uh, uh, team. Uh, we think very carefully about the thesis areas that we think can bring about this transformative outlay uh, to the old thesis of reducing greenhouse gas emissions. And then we search for opportunities um, that will support these thesis areas. And in so doing, you know, you're bringing together the confluence of technology and enterprise formation necessarily we have to offer some support uh, to some of the companies that uh, uh, we, we back. Uh, so we are quite hands-on in, uh, investors. Uh, we, we do more than providing just mere financial capital. Thank you. And from your perspective, Green Climate Fund as financing mechanism of a United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. On which technologies we should focus more and support them as a financing, a climate financing institution? That is, that requires a crystal ball um, <laughs> to answer that question. But I would say that I would encourage the same approach that Breakthrough Energy pursues, which is for us to really think about carbon zero. How do we find technologies that give us a pathway towards achieving a very, very transformative reduction um, in carbon emissions. The thing is that it's a race against time, right? Uh, we are running out of time. Uh, we need to find very transformative technologies. And so whatever sector it is, whether it's in you know, electricity or in transportation, the key compass is, is it a transformative technology or is it an incremental technology? We've run out of time for incremental approaches. We do need to have very transformative approaches that could bring us um, to carbon zero. Very true, very true indeed. Definitely paradigm shifting is one of the, our investment criteria at the Green Climate Fund and transformative projects. This is cornerstone of our approach to the analysis and promotion of the innovation in the climate uh, related activities. So thank you very much uh, for your insight. Now uh, to Sakjun. Sakjun, uh, Korea, from our perspective, is definitely on the forefront of technological innovation. We evidence it 
is our own eyes experiences living here in Songdo. And I believe our experience is shared by many millions of people who either visited Korea as tourists or had the chance to connect at the marvelous Incheon Airport. So it's not a surprise for us that Korean government is on the forefront of the support of innovative technologies. This establishment of your organization, Born to Global. So from your perspective, what are the best practices in your approach to the support of innovative projects that can be replicated by other developing countries? What are the recipes and solutions that they can take from you as an example of treating innovation and promoting it for further growth? Thank you, Andre. I think to summarize my answer, it would be how uh, the nation and the society and the economic policymakers view uh, as the role of science and technology policy and the role of uh, the socioeconomic support in promoting especially entrepreneurs and deep tech startups. Uh, the way we see it here at Born to Global Center, um, well, as many people view startups as early SMEs uh, needing to grow into larger companies, we like to view them more as deep tech innovators. And if they are to be seen and if they are treated as deep tech innovators, then the, the role of labs or incubation labs or RNDB facilities uh, and platforms like Born to Global become just as important or even more important than government subsidies and other financial measures. And since we are talking about technology transfer to developed economies, I think we should talk a little bit more about how we work in that area. Uh, we believe that deep tech acceleration is all about R&DB. And to focus on that B function, we like to uh, focus a lot of our energy on PMF programs or product market fit programs. In particular, uh, the area that we are talking about today, which is climate tech, most of the climate tech startups and entrepreneurs have a very difficult time promoting and attracting private investment, I think, which is one of the reasons why we are gathered here today. And um, to promote the, this kind of private sector investment into climate tech entrepreneurs and companies, we believe that scaling up would equal going global. Because going global means that we have already built globally competent uh, deep tech solution companies. And in going global, the policy that we have adopted since a few years ago has been to promote joint ventures or collaborative partnerships globally between Korean startups, entrepreneurs, and global entrepreneurs. Basically, our policy and our theory is that once we build these global partnerships, then uh, the investments will follow, uh, hence closing the gap between early stage startups and large um, and often uh, market dominant uh, enterprises, especially in the developing economies. So how are we going to build these joint ventures or collaborative partners uh, between developed and developing economies? One of the experiments that we've been conducting since last year has been to source deep tech companies, uh, especially in climate technology. And these climate technology is not just by mitigation as uh, Andrew mentioned, uh, but also adaptation. So these can uh, have a large scope ranging from 5G, AI, IoT, big data, to even blockchain. So once we source these deep tech companies, including Korea, we would then go out to the local um, or the local industries or even the developing uh, company, uh, developing country um, startups and try to find startups in developing economies that do not probably have the deep tech that the advanced economies have, but have much better localization and operational capacity. So what we are trying to build is we hold a series of these uh, online meetups between deep tech startups and local developing country entrepreneurs and startups. And we try to match them in terms of the relevancy of these the technological areas. For example, we have a drone company in Korea that uses hydrogen fuel. Now, uh, there are so many drone companies, even in developing economies that are trying to solve problems related to climate uh, technology through drones and, and drone related technology, but their problem is always the battery. So now when we have the, the hydrogen powered drone technology, the developed economy, in this case, a Korea startup will then share that technology 
with the local company that already has the operational and the localization capacity, we go through a very intensive consultation process so that we can actually help them build a joint venture that is jointly shared in terms of the, the shareholding powers between that uh, deep tech company and the local um, or the developing economy uh, startup. And they would go on and try to localize uh, that solution and to expand from there. So what we are trying to seek is not only to send our startups overseas, but also to build and, and promote the ecosystem of green and climate technopreneurship, even in the developing economies. We realized that since our topic is private investment uh, for climate, we realized that most of the reasons and most of the barriers, financing barriers for these climate tech entrepreneurs is the long development timeline. Because you know, uh, venture capitals are, are, are not going to be sitting there for three, four, five years uh, trying to uh, see if these uh, solutions work. Now, once we've built these joint ventures, what, the way we try to attract private investment is to try to get them involved in public or uh, development projects by many multilateral development banks. So in the conventional methods of uh, development projects, uh, the recipient country would receive the funds from an MDB and they would try to source a global technology company uh, to come in and provide the solution for them. But what happens is after three, four, five years of their project duration, and when these global companies leave the country, uh, the countries uh, are left with nothing much than the existing solution. However, when we try to involve these joint venture companies with the tech transfers to be the actual enablers of that solution for these multilateral development bank projects, the countries have, are already have that local company that can deploy that solution in their own country, which makes the, the tech transfer and the tech deployment much more sustainable. So that's one of the um, key areas that Born to Global and the Korean government is working on um, to, uh, you know, to answer your question in terms of uh, globally expanding and enabling tech transfers that um, allow mutual good for Korea, for the developed economies and the developing economies as well. Yeah, this is such a thoughtful answer and detailed strategy. I think those of us who are still asking ourselves how and why economic wonder of Korea happened, uh, I think it's no surprise for us anymore. So thank you, Sokjin, but we know that venture deals and innovation deals are not only success and happiness. There's a big issue of survival rate, which is quite low. Venture capital compensate for the losses with quite significant margins on the top of the successful enterprises. How do you deal in your well, semi-governmental setup uh, with this issue? How do you address the issue of the survival rate? Thank you, Andre. And you are you're perfectly right. Uh, the technical and the commercialization values of death are probably the key reasons why climate tech entrepreneurs cannot succeed and not even get to the POC stage. Uh, we believe that that's where um, organizations like us and global leadership organizations like GCF should come in. What we try to do is once these joint ventures are formed and the tech transfers happen, the initial stages must be supported by either the semi-public, the public, or the global organization sector. So what we um, believe could work would be uh, the GCF, for example, in terms of climate tech entrepreneurs, promoting the formation of these joint ventures between developed economy and developed economy uh, startups, and to provide them initial grants where they can use that funds to conduct R&DB activities. One of the examples that we are conducting now is we've built a design lab um, nearby actually your office here in Korea. And that design lab will act as an incubator. So once these joint ventures are formed, they need about at least three months up to six, eight months of joint R&DB activities so that they can take that technology, learn it, and then to localize it. Uh, that activity should be supported by a public organization uh, like us or even by the GCF so that these joint ventures and the tech transfers can actually happen and happen until they reach a POC stage and come up with an actual product and solution.
So we believe that through this joint venture scheme, we can resolve the three biggest issues in climate tech entrepreneurship. First issue being that most of these climate tech entrepreneurs are very early stage. We will try to solve that through company building and formation of these joint ventures between proven models and localized models. We believe that the long term issue of climate tech uh, can be resolved by introducing some of the proven business models and proven technological solutions from other sectors and applying it uh, to either mitigation or adaptation technology or solutions. Thirdly, we believe that we need to also work on building an ecosystem and we are hoping to work with organizations like the GCF so that we cannot just support the startups and the entrepreneurs, but also to build an ecosystem uh, through our knowledge share and collaboration uh, mechanisms and process. Thank you. Thank you, Sabjian. Well, definitely, I think that it's a good way for us to find the potential collaboration. Many aspects of your business model that you outlined very well resonate with the Green Climate Fund, its business model and investment criteria. We are a risk taking institution, happy to support innovative technologies and climate related uh, innovations so i believe that your efforts and attempts to to reach uh, to the uh, to the investment audience definitely will be a good outcome of our potential uh, joint efforts thank you thank you very much uh, now over to paul uh, and uh, paul you outline uh, some of the key elements of your venture related to the sustainable development goal number seven access to affordable reliable and sustainable energy for all it's a hard work and definitely you, you made a lot of progress along that way but there is a long way to come so how are we tracking against cdg7 Unfortunately, we're not tracking very well towards SDG 7. Um, when I started in this sector in about uh, 2010, there were 1.2 billion people without access to electricity. Uh, today, we're at about seven or 800 million people. Sounds like progress, but by 2050, there will still be 600 million people without access to electricity if we continue at this pace. So. Um, we need to pick up the pace. More work needs to be done. We need to look for models that are working and invest to scale those up. Um, Sokjin, it was great to hear you talk about, you know, the importance of identifying models that work, the importance of business model innovation and venture building. And Bunmi, to hear your focus not just on providing capital, but, but really this enterprise development support that's so essential as well. Um, Oftentimes, it seems human nature, the greater the crisis, the more likely we are to rush in with an unsustainable solution because we're looking for immediate impact. And that, that I think, is something about human nature and our, our desire for action uh, and, and to address an immediate issue. But of course, the climate emergency is not a short term emergency. We need to invest uh, for long term solutions. Um, I was really made aware of this visiting uh, villages in India and Mozambique and uh, Tanzania, where I saw um, many solar projects that had been built and abandoned, uh, built through donations and philanthropic approaches to deploying solar. You uh, often encounter solar street lighting programs that uh, people remember were launched with great fanfare, politicians visiting, cutting ribbons, uh, and a year later, the system's not operating anymore. Uh, I saw um, a health clinics electrified and systems broken. I saw many customers who had purchased solar energy systems for their own homes or for their businesses, and the companies that sold them the systems weren't providing any service. So five years in or three years in, these systems weren't, were no longer operating. So I was really struck by the fact that you know, the technologies already exist to provide universal access to sustainable energy. The technologies are there. What's not there are, uh, are the, the incentives to deliver that solution over the long run. 
And uh, when we launched Simpa Networks, the focus was really on designing a business model that could deliver access to energy at scale and sustainably over time. A model that could attract private capital uh, that would generate attractive returns for investors and, uh, and could scale. Uh, our, our ambition first was, of, of course, in India, uh, but the model, and we've done a lot to promote the model, uh, the model has been uh, replicated and, and copied and improved upon by many other companies around the world. Uh, so the, the model, as I mentioned before, is a pay-as-you-go solar model. Um, as Sukjin advised, we borrowed ideas from the mobile phone industry. Uh, in most developing markets, people purchase a low-cost phone, but it doesn't work until you prepay for, for service or talk time. That's how our solar energy products worked as well. You make a small upfront payment, you get the equipment installed, you get a solar panel, battery, lights, fans, some appliances, but it doesn't work until you prepay for service. So the customer, just like topping up their mobile phone, they go to a local agent in the village, prepay for five days, 10 days, a month, whatever they can afford, almost like sachet marketing for, for energy. Uh, and the, the system magically turns on for the prepaid number of days. And then uh, as they're running out of credits, they start to get SMS messages on the phone, alerting them, and they go back to the local agent and top up the system again. But those payments for service add up towards the total purchase price. And once they've paid for the system, using it for two or three years, uh, it unlocks permanently. They own the appliances, they own the panel, they own the battery, and they get free electricity. So it's really a lease to own model, but with micro payments that are affordable to the mass market. And um, uh, yes, so I think that the key is really business model innovation, financial innovation. And, um, and, and we found as we scaled, we needed to access different kinds of capital. Uh, initially, some grant funds, then some angel impact investors, some institutional impact investors, uh, we got long-term loans from Asian Development Bank and from OPIC uh, and, and others to finance the CapEx uh, so we could scale up. So it, it's, of course, exciting to be um, working with and talking to Green Climate Fund because of your financial interventions that I think uh, can de-risk some of these, uh, these business model innovations. Yes, indeed, Paul. Uh, you can go hand in hand this green climate front from grant financing to equity to subordinated loan and then senior loan and find appropriate funding and uh, conditions mix that would allow you to unlock the potential of the uh, technical solutions for the fulfillment of the SDG7. But uh, from our perspective, we recognize that the private sector is only part of the story and engaging public sector into the projects of innovation and technology is also important. From your experience, can you provide some examples of public private partnership solutions that might be useful and instrumental for this purpose? Yes, well, I've been, I've been really inspired by the, the actions of the private sector. Um, I mean, you, companies are getting it from all angles. They're getting pressure from their employees to align their businesses with the Paris targets. Uh, uh, there's hu huge upswell uh, of uh, action from high-tech employees in Silicon Valley and across the world pressuring their companies to be uh, more responsible, to switch to renewable energy and to, to go beyond net zero. Um, corporates are getting uh, pressure as well from global investors. You might be familiar with the um, uh, Climate Action 100, which is a coalition of over 500 global investors uh, with over $47 trillion in assets under management, um, putting pressure on the companies that they invest in to align their business plans with the, the Paris targets. In Europe, we have the Institutional Investors Group on Climate Change, uh, uh, 240 members, 33 trillion euros in assets under management, similarly putting pressure uh, and, uh, on, on companies and uh, affecting policy 
to, uh, to create the right incentives for companies to, again, align their business plans with the Paris targets. Um, and, and of course, we're hearing from, from private companies, it, it, uh, such as uh, you know, the big tech companies. It's kind of exciting to see climate leadership coming from some of the most cash rich companies the world has ever seen. Um, one of my favorites is uh, Microsoft, who has been carbon neutral from uh, 2012, uh, carbon negative by 2030 is their plan. And by 2050, they intend to remove all the carbon from the atmosphere that they've ever generated since the company was founded on April 4th, 1975. A very ambitious uh, plan sets a new bar. Um, about two weeks after they announced that, Google sort of quietly announced and said, well, actually we did the math and yeah, we've already achieved that. So uh, the, 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 the competition for uh, climate leadership is something that is, is quite exciting. All of these companies, Amazon as, as well, and uh, Apple too, have set aside billion dollar funds to invest in climate tech. So the, there's some really exciting developments there. I'm especially interested in the renewable electricity uh, movements of uh, the private sector. RE100 is an organization, a membership organization formed by uh, the climate group and CDP. Uh, members of RE100 make public commitments to power their global businesses with 100% renewable energy. Uh, 240 companies have signed on to this now, generating demand for 281 terawatt hours of clean energy every year. Uh, 260 companies sounds like a lot. It's a small, small sliver of uh, what is to come. Uh, thousands of global corporates will be signing up and committing to these kinds of things uh, uh, over time. And this is absolutely shifting demand for renewable energy. Um, these corporates alone last year committed to 19 gigawatts of new power. Now the problem, or the, to your question about uh, the need for more uh, public-private uh, partnerships here, um, although RE100 and this movement to, sh to sh the corporates shifting to renewable electricity is fantastic and it's, it is uh, generating demand and, and making capital available for renewable energy projects, it's, it's mostly happening in the US and in Europe. And emerging markets have not yet benefited from this really important dynamic of corporate demand. I think what we really need is a global market for renewable electricity. So when a company like Microsoft says, you know, we're gonna generate more clean energy than we've ever consumed, for example, um, they should be able to make investments in Uganda to offset the dirty electricity that they might have to consume because of whatever grid they're connected to uh, in the US. And so, uh, together with uh, South Pole, um, who was, uh, uh, Renat was speaking earlier today, um, we have formed, we're, we're pulling together a task force for distributed renewable energy certification. It's a multi-stakeholder group involving several corporates, uh, as well as standards organizations, as well as actors and, and industry associations and project developers in emerging markets where the objective is to design, deliver, and demonstrate a new market instrument called a DREC, a Distributed Renewable Energy Certificate. And we're piloting this uh, together with UNDP it, uh, with a program they have to electrify health clinics in Zimbabwe, uh, Uganda, and Eswatini. So with UNDP, we've identified over a thousand hospitals health clinics, COVID isolation centers that are unelectrified or underelectrified. Uh, UNDP and its partners are providing the upfront capital to build the energy systems, um, but corporates are coming in to purchase the environmental attributes or the DRECs from these projects that will support the ongoing operations and maintenance for the lifetime of the projects. So you've got a combination here of donor funded, ultimately taxpayer funded um, uh, investments in the CapEx, but the long-term sustainability of those projects would not be there unless corporates 
could also uh, purchase the environmental attributes and support the ongoing operations and maintenance. So this, this project is in development now, and uh, it's really a model transaction of, uh, of one of many ways that this DREC market instrument could be deployed. Thank you, Paul. Well, definitely you are full of solutions that might be absolutely relevant for our projects. Starting from the largest one, like for example, Desert to Power, which is intending to transform the entire Sahel region of Africa from a, a desert into the power source, not only for the continent, but maybe for the entire planet. And both mm -hmm. on-grid and off-grid components of this project might be served and improved by the technological and business solutions you are promoting and just outlined to us. But at the same time, we realize that the sky is not without cloud. Mm -hmm. And these clouds create a lot of hassle for the uh, renewable energy like solar panels. More on that, uh, nighttime basically convert them from, well, let's say, source of power into something that does not create power at all. That intermittency is definitely one of the key predicament for wide adaptation and application of the renewable energy solutions around the world. Fortunately for us, we have very good partners with interesting technologies that would help us to address the intermittency issue of the renewable energy. Let me interrupt our session with a brief uh, video from the company Energy Vault, our good friends and hopefully partners.
Well, I guess uh, good look is uh, a thousand times more than all the words that we can say. And uh, honestly speaking, as I see it, Merrick, your system looks great. But maybe can you just say a few words about the technology principles and overall solution that you provide to the renewable energy markets with your uh, company? Sure, Andre. Um, thanks for uh, showing the video. It's a, it's a little better than me trying to explain it. Um, the, the, the technology, you know, it really, when the company was formed, it was formed for the very reason that we've heard about so far. It's the ability to take the intermittent resources of the renewables and turn them into dispatchable and baseload products. And as, as, as Boom may mentioned, it, it, there are long range solutions way into the future that will be required to get the numbers down to the very, very low levels that will ultimately need to be carbon zero or, or, or carbon negative. And we recognize that and, and continue to work on those, those types of technologies. But where we wanted to focus immediately was where we could make an impact quickly. And so we looked at all of the technologies that were currently available to do energy storage to identify the ones which we could apply our skill sets to, to improve, enhance, and accelerate um, into the market. And the one that we liked to, to achieve that was the gravity-based solutions. Gravity-based solutions led by pumped hydro have been around for 100 years. Um, and over that time, I've seen very little, very little change in the way they operate. And they have some fundamental underlying challenges. You, you have to have a high reservoir and a low reservoir. Um, and you have to build hundreds of megawatt hours or gigawatt hours in a single location to make the economics viable. So what we wanted to do was to say, could we come up with a technology which keeps all of the benefits of pumped hydro? So 30 year life, no degradation, no loss of capacity over, over time, um, no self discharge, no loss of power as you go flexibility and operation, simple O and M, proven components. But at the same time, take away some of the restrictions that a pumped hydro facility has. Um, the, the, the biggest of which is without a doubt, the need for special topography. Every gravity based solution before Energy Vault has always required some sort of special topography, whether that's the high and low reservoir, whether it's a disused mine shaft, a six mile hillside, or a mountainside um, you know, to run a disused uh, uh, chair lift. There was always a requirement for some special topography. And so what we developed was uh, a technology where we could build it anywhere. Um, the way it works is very, very simple in operation, just like pumped hydro. Um, but instead of using an electric pump to pump water up a hill, we use an electric motor to lift um, blocks from a low position to a high position. The energy is stored as potential energy, which is key because if there's no electrons, no heat, no compression, no freezing, there's nothing to lose. Potential energy cannot be lost. Um, when we want the energy back, we simply lower the bricks from the high position to the low position. Um, the braking mechanism that stops the brick crashing to the ground effectively turns the motor into a generator, the exact same way as it does in your electric car or your hybrid car. When you press the brake, you regenerate the exact same, um, the exact same principle. So that, that's how the technology works. I do want to point out that we often get referred to as concrete towers. The bricks are not actually made of concrete. We have a special polymer invented by Semex, who's one of our uh, it, one of our partners. The bricks themselves are actually made from either recycled or recyclable material. So we can use the soil at the site, or we can use some waste such as uh, co-combustion residue. Um, a lot of, around the world, we know there are a lot of issues with bottom ash sitting in ash ponds that are poisoning water. 
um, really affecting farming. We can, we can take that waste. We can also use things like mine tailings. Uh, again, waste that can cause environmental damage because while um, removing carbon is a, is, a, is a great goal and something that obviously that we're all focused on, I do think the circular economy is another big part of what we need to deliver in, in the coming decades. I think the, the, the generation of use it once and throw it away, we have to, go, we have to get past that. So I think very important that we can that, that that we make it clear that when we build these bricks, we do make them out of recycled and recyclable uh, material. Thank you, Merrick. Well, it was like yesterday we call each other first time. I was really excited. I remember that moment when I saw the technology myself. I was really excited to think how well thought the idea and what can be done with that going forward. Well, we still in the process of finalizing the first system. Definitely the challenges I hear in terms of technological challenges, in terms of uh, regulatory concerns and other things. COVID does not help us to bring the thing quicker to the market. But nevertheless, we are making good progress and hopefully your system will be part of one of the funding proposal submissions that we will receive and support at the Green Climate Fund in the coming months. But before that, from your experience, what are the key challenges of bringing new technology to the new market from your perspective? Yeah, so it's a great question. And, and I think there are there are key challenges at different phases of, of, of the process when you have something literally as a, which starts as a drawing on a, on, on a sheet of paper. Um, I, the initial challenge is to find your angel investors, the people who come in right at the beginning who, who buy into the idea. And at that point, a lot of it is about the, the, the quality of where the idea is coming from. You know, our business came out of Idea Lab. Um, you know, Bill Gross is the longest running incubator in the US. So that, that gives us instant credibility when, when the idea is coming, coming from somewhere like, somewhere like that. So I think that that first step is, is important. The, the next thing which is important is you need to be able to demonstrate the breakthroughs that are required for your technology. And ideally, if you can do that cheaply, right? Not having to spend a lot of money before you find your fatal flaws is, is, is a critical part to be able to get the backers in early. And that was one of the great advantages we had with our technology is that we were able to buy a, a secondhand rusty 27 meter crane um, and use it to demonstrate the, the, the special control algorithms that, that, that we needed. So not a lot of money, be able to fail quickly and feel cheaply if that if that's what's going to happen. And then as we move forward, as we move forward from that and this and 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 started to get success with the pilot plant and demonstrated that the breakthroughs could be made, could be delivered, the, the thing which enabled our Series B round and the large investment that we got from uh, SoftBank's vision fund was the potential for for the technology out in the market. You, you have to have something that can be delivered widely to make a real impact because that's where the guys like Breakthrough Ventures and the Vision Fund, that's where they want to invest their money, where you can make a big difference. There are many, many great ideas that, ha that are niche solutions that find it much more difficult to get the quality and the size of the backing that you can get. So having something that has that wide ranging solution and for us with, uh, with Energy Vault, that really was the, removement, the, the removal of the special topography. If we were only to build this in places where there was mountainsides or, 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 you know, or disused mine shafts, this would, it would have been a much, harder, a much harder challenge. So I think very important then um, that, that you, you have a big market to go after. And then, at the stage we're at now, of course, which is actually getting commercial ones deployed, it's finding those customers who not only see the value long term, but have the entrepreneurial spirit to be early adopters. 
those, those early adopters for a business like ours are absolutely key to find. And, you know, I have spent a lot of the last 18 months talking to hundreds of potential customers to identify the, the, the handful who are ready to put, uh, put the money at work. And, and that is, it, it's hard work, but it's, it's very rewarding and it's, cha it, it's capable to be done, particularly in the developed world. And where the Green Climate Fund has really come in is helping us to, to find one of those projects in, 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 a, in a developing country. Because without the support of the Green Climate Fund, we, we simply wouldn't be able to deliver this product into a developing country for a longer, for a longer period. We, you know, the, the developing world does a very good job of taking the cost of things and making them cheaper through government support, renewable portfolio standards. You know, I saw it when I was in the wind industry. I saw it when I was in the solar industry. I'm sure it will happen in the storage industry as well, but we don't want to have to wait. And that's where I think, you know, the Green Climate Fund have done a great, a great job in making that happen. Thank you, Merrick. Uh, definitely, I would like to take our video today and bring it to the GCF board for SWIFT, and immediate approval of your project for support by the Green Climate Fund. So let's team up and continue our work together. Uh, we've been uh, discussing our climate and technology related issues with a quite uh, small number of quite uh, <laughs> powerful terms. Hardship, hard work, fight, challenge, looks like a computer game in this virtual environment. So here's the big boss, <laughs> Jay. Uh, I think that we are coming with the hardest questions uh, to you. Mitigation projects are relatively straightforward in terms of assessing the impacts and delivering the results. You are focusing on adaptation, which is a big, big, big problem for, for the private sector. Adaptation in the climate context takes decades in order to start and then finish something that you are investing. You spend years and years before the result, results will become visible. So from your perspective, your experience, what are the most ad promising adaptation projects that you encounter, that you support, or maybe reach maturity and success that you can share with us. Thanks for the question, Andre. And I, I have to say, um, I've been on a lot of panels. And I know a lot of us have been as well. This is one where I've actually learned a tremendous amount just in the last few minutes alone. I think the range of technology solutions that I don't understand, like Bunmi's focus on fusion, uh, and then the deployment of incredibly smart uh, concrete, uh, uh, or I guess polymer oriented solutions like what Merritt's talking about on the gravity storage side, Plus the just intelligence of connecting the dots, as Sakjin has said, between super high technology but localized developing country entrepreneurs. Uh, and then Paul's cautionary notes on making sure it's local, it's distributed, and it's sustainable, I think is, you know, to me has been uh, worth a cup of coffee that I had this morning. So Andre, thank you for bringing together such a wonderful set of experts. Adaptation is a difficult challenge and it has been for everyone, uh, particularly given GCF's 50% target in deployment here. And while um, all of this has been a focal area for a while, and it's an equal priority under the Paris Agreement, adaptation finance as mitigation finance, it's still less than five or 6% of global climate finance tracked on the planet. It's been consistently stuck at that level. Um, and the one thing I would say, Andre, to take a slight issue with your, your challenge uh, premise here is I don't think adaptation takes decades. I think adaptation happens all the time. We just don't call it that. The question is how premeditated we are gonna be about it and the scale at which we're actually going to be able to do that. Rich people will adapt. They have the resources to do it. The poor people of the world, the disadvantaged populations in developed countries and in developing countries specifically, that is where the enormous challenge is going to be. And the key here is bringing technologies and solutions to scale and bringing them down in cost and bringing them to people who are going to be impacted most dramatically by this as fast as possible. Even at one and a half or two degrees, of warming, we have dramatic impacts as we're already seeing at 1.1 degrees with this wildfire season we're seeing in California again, 
after last year's Australia disasters, both of which are dwarfed in the actual economic impact by the monsoons and extreme flooding we've seen in Asia just this year alone. This is not going away. This will be unfortunately the future of our future and the future of our children's future. The problems will become increasingly complex, much more uh, difficult to understand, and much more impactful. It's a humanitarian disaster. It's also an economic and financial disaster. And if we don't think that we can come out of the COVID environment without having to address this and the equity impacts of that entire fragility that we're seeing, we're in for a very, very big surprise. And that surprise will be continuous forever. I have a four-year-old daughter, and in 10 years from now, the world that she will be in will look dramatically different than the one we have today, even if we're successful at holding warming to one and a half or two degrees, which I think remains an enormous challenge. So adaptation should be and is a critical priority. Lightsmith, through the craft strategy, is finding existing companies that have technologies and solutions that can help analyze that problem. If we don't understand how the problem will manifest, there is absolutely no way that we can address it in an ex-ante premeditated fashion. We'll always just be cleaning up after the last disaster, and there's not enough money in the world to continue to be able to do that, certainly in the public sector, and not in the private sector either. So we need to be smart about how we're gonna approach this enormous problem, and the first step is getting the tools to analyze what the problem's gonna look like. So we are looking today at companies that already look at that type of risk, weather risk, catastrophe risk, supply chain risk, water risk, agricultural risk, energy reliability risk, financial services risk. Fire risk is not a new thing. We've had fire risk since we discovered fire. Gigafire risk is a new thing. Now we need to take the way that we actually analyze risk and, and shift it and scale it and orient it at the future. The last 10, 20, 50 years, which is how we typically model the future, are not going to look like the next 10, 20, and 50 years. And so we need to actually orient those types of companies that have the ability to analyze those risks wherever they are in the world, against water, against agriculture, against supply chains, against wildfires, against natural disasters, against healthcare, and orient them at the future set of conditions and bring them as quickly as possible so that folks that are sitting in Dhaka or in Bangladesh or in other places have the same ability to understand what the risk is gonna be as people sitting in Seoul, Korea, London, or New York. And if we don't do that, the distribution of the impact at risk on those populations will be dramatically worse. In addition to that, we need technologies that can scale that exist today. There's certainly a need for venture capital and innovation to drive new technologies of the type that Sakjin's talking about, to localize them, to bring them immediately into these markets. But our view right now is that there's also existing technologies at the growth stage. So we're looking at Kraft and at Lightsmith, at companies that have $5 million to $100 million of revenue today, <laughs> that already have the product market fit that Sakjin's talked about that are gonna to scale to accelerate their ability to quickly get to the billions of dollars of size that we want these companies with solutions, technologies, and tools to be at as the problem gets to the trillion dollars of size scale. So for example, one of them, uh, we're happy to be joining Breakthrough Energy Ventures this summer in an investment in a company called Source Global. This is a solar hydro panels company. So instead of generating electricity from solar power, it generates pure drinking water anywhere in the world. So the ability for a transformative technology like that, that's not simply desalination minus 5% of inefficiency or minus 5% of carbon footprint, this is an entirely new mechanism and technology system for generating distributed, entirely sustainably powered, renewably powered 10 to 15 year water supplies anywhere in the world. Now clearly there is a uh, climate vulnerability that we can identify out of IPCC or German Watch reporting, increasing drought risk, uh, in targeted parts of South, South uh, Africa, as well as East Africa, large parts of Asia, even Latin America and the Caribbean, which has never experienced this kind of impact before. And technologies like this that can actually replicate the strategy we've had in solar energy with solar water, the 25-year ecosystem building exercise that Paul's been part of, that can distribute these uh, technologies, model them, finance them, pay as you drink, uh, like pay as you go. Um, these are the types of technologies that can represent the ability to transform uh, our uh, economy and our society to meet the adaptation challenge as it comes forward. The happy circumstance and the, and the thing that we need to focus on is the fact that these are mitigation and adaptation technologies. This kind of water generation solution displaces high carbon intensity desalination or trucked or containerized bottled water solutions, which is why Breakthrough has been involved uh, at earlier stages. And at this stage, when they have full commercialization and the ability to deploy projects, Growth investors like us that are looking at 
inflection at bringing those technologies as quickly as possible with the help of institutions like the Green Climate Fund, with the support of institutions like the Global Environment Facility or the European Investment Bank, or most recently in Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, or NDF, or KFW, or even Rockefeller Foundation or AXA, this is the way that we can scale the technologies that we have today to begin to meet the challenge we're going to see in the next three to five years and to develop the technologies that we're going to need 10 and 20 years from now as the problem becomes much more substantial. We are cynical optimists. We are cynical about the state of the challenges in the world, but optimistic about the possibility today of entrepreneurs and technologists to meet the scale of the challenge if we can orient technology and capital hand in hand and to bring it as quickly as possible to those parts of the world that need it um, most and will need it in an increasingly important fashion. But there are plenty of technologies out there right now, Andre. There are technologies that analyze water risk and water scarcity. We found the company that actually helped to address the Cape Town drought situation that deployed thousands of meters and uh, efficiency software to help address parts of those problems. That could be deployed anywhere in the world uh, if it can work in South Africa. We found companies in India that have uh, risk analytics and geospatial imagery and mapping that can help to actually analyze how crop failure is going to accelerate in different parts of the world and can be localized in Latin America or Southern Africa. And we want to join hands and partner with lots of folks around the world to be able to do this. The one thing I would add here is part of the mystery around adaptation has been, what does it mean? What does adaptation mean? The average human has no idea. And when I joined uh, the private sector advisory group to the Green Climate Fund in 2014, I had no idea either. What we think is a really important first step in addressing that problem is that we have at, uh, in, increased um, our engagement with companies and have recently released with the support of the Global Environment Facility of the UN and the Inter-American Development Bank, a taxonomy called the ASAP Taxonomy, uh, which stands for the Adaptation SME Accelerator Project Taxonomy. So this taxonomy, which is available on our website and IDB's website, that's lightsmithgp.com, actually provides a pathway for companies, SMEs, to identify a climate vulnerability that they address in a sector that they're in and a way to measure their progress and support for interventions against that vulnerability and to actually define themselves as an adaptation SME. We have now, through that project, through ASAP, identified over 300 of these companies in developing countries, in Latin America and the Caribbean, in Asia and Africa. By the time the project concludes next year, we expect it to be closer to 600 to 900 of these companies. And these are entrepreneurs that are working today in those local developing countries in agricultural analytics, in water, in supply chain analytics, in geospatial imagery, in weather modeling and weather analytics, uh, in energy reliability, and even in healthcare. Uh, so maybe five years ago, people would not have said a climate impact is childhood asthma. But it turns out if you light most of California and Australia and parts of Europe and parts of Africa on fire, you have a lot more childhood asthma. So healthcare diagnostics will be critical here too as well. So this uh, taxonomy is available to everyone. There'll be a global website launched in the next four to six weeks. And we think it's an important step that helps create the SME landscape that craft and other strategies on the investment side can take to scale. Adaptation is a necessity now. It will be a necessity, unfortunately, for the rest of the future of humanity. And we need to uh, analyze how we can bring technology and capital to that problem. Thank you, Andre. Thank you, Jay. Uh, I believe you're not the only one who knew uh, something interesting at today's session. Me personally, uh, finding out about this coupling of water production technology with renewable energy is definitely music to our ears and it can be successfully coupled with uh, large global initiatives like Desert to Power and provide missing links to other undertakings supported by the Green Climate Fund, like Green Great, green great Wall. So from that perspective, I believe that this panel might be a good opportunity for us to continue working together, supporting innovative ideas and projects that you are providing uh, to, to the business community, to the people and the end beneficiaries who are going to be uh, receiving the results and outputs uh, of our work. But a uh, small, uh, but nevertheless important uh, thing of our adaptation project consideration is the issue of maladaptation. Unfortunately, we are not able to solve infrastructure issues or establish a production facility 
with a wave of magic wand. We always have to undertake some industrial activities, construction, transportation. Some of them are quite heavy in terms of living carbon footprint. It might be inherently dependable on the heavy emission uh, factor grades of uh, specific countries that support well, definitely visible adaptation solution, but at the same time providing detrimental effects uh, from the CO2 emission point of view. So how do you treat the issue of maladaptation in your approaches? I think it's an incredibly important question and one that specifically, again, um, requires us to not think about a siloed approach to climate action. Mitigation and adaptation need to be working together. If you build renewable energy projects and don't account for the fact that solar and hydro and wind resources are gonna change because the weather is changing, they will fail. There are numerous instances that we can see of highly energy efficient buildings that have been completely flooded above the entrance to the buildings by the recent hurricane impact that we've seen. And the Western Hemisphere have now run out of names for hurricanes. And so we're now using the Greek alphabet because we're well beyond what was originally forecast. Energy efficient buildings that are literally underwater are not buildings anymore, they're aquariums. So we need to really be thoughtful about how we're actually gonna strategize and move forward and integrate a net zero approach that is truly climate resilient, or we will be looking at failures of those projects just like we're looking at failures of non-green projects. So to your question specifically, um, our first order of business and the strategy of the craft vehicle is focusing on, to a large degree, data and analytics. If we do not know how the path of risk will change going forward, then we are basically taking the viewpoint that the delta is zero. We're gonna drive looking in the rearview mirror into an increasingly stormy environment. And that is not a great way to actually deploy trillions of dollars of infrastructure, which we're about to do in response to COVID um, it, it, for a future that's gonna be dramatically different than we may have now. So I would, I would say your default isn't neutral adaptation, it's maladaptation right now because the assumption is that the delta is zero. So first, let's invest in technology, data, and analytics that exist that help us understand what the path of risk is. Let us get a map to the future, the best map we can, a dynamic set of models that look forward, not forensically backwards. And that is a first step to avoiding maladaptation. The second piece of that is the equity discussion that we've had, the local discussion that we've had, the country ownership orientation of the Green Climate Fund, and everything that Paul's talking about in terms of sustainability at the local level, and what Sokjin's talking about in terms of taking technology and localizing it is a critical requirement of avoiding maladaptation. You cannot staple gun solutions from Seoul or from New York into other developing countries. They will not take, they will not work, they do not take account of the local environment. And if we don't pay attention to the equity issues that have been starkly put into contrast here by the COVID situation, then we will fail as a society. Um, not just on climate, but on everything else. So that's the second point, which is making sure there is engagement uh, at the community level, at the local level, so that the pathways will work for those localized environments. That's why ASAP focusing on local SMEs, that's why Sakjin's engagement at the local level, that's why Paul's like walking around and looking at what's actually happening five years on. That's why the country ownership model that GCF pursues, I think, is really critical in making sure that these solutions work in the local environment. Entrepreneurs in the local environment know what works for them. That's the second step. And the third step is, I worry about maladaptation. I worry a lot more about no adaptation. Okay, right now the problem isn't, oh wow, we're doing so much adaptation and some of it's probably not done appropriately. Right now we're doing virtually no ex-ante adaptation, okay? We, we are at a fraction of what we need, about I think 24, to 40 billion against what is targeted to be 300 billion a year by 2030 or more, according to UNFP, UNEP. We are, we're not any close to understanding uh, how to deploy technologies and understand local environments. We keep getting surprised every year by these extreme weather events. They're not one in 100 events anymore. They're one in 20 events or one in five events. But when you have three one in 100 year events in Houston in a row, I think your models are just wrong. So let's update the models and let's bring them to people that need them. Let's update the technology and scale it and bring it down in cost and bring it to the people where uh, they need it. And, and a lot of that technology and a lot of that analytics and knowledge is in developed countries. So let's find it and localize it and scale it. 
But number one, let's do it. There's a huge challenge in mobilizing adaptation finance. And I think the Green Climate Fund and other entities can take the risk of launching and supporting instruments, just as we did 15 or 20 years ago in mitigation, that can bring us to the scale that we have today. We have hundreds of gigawatts now of wind energy, which was unimaginable 10 and 20 years ago. We are at the very beginning of beginning to understand how we should adapt to what is going to be an unfortunate, dynamic, increasingly volatile and permanent problem for the human race, which is adapting to the climate changed future. So let's get started. Let's deploy capital now. Thank you, Jay. That's very inspiring. And I believe that from now on, more and more private sector sources, private sector actors will be looking at adaptation as one of the potential areas where capital will be effectively deployed and find appropriate returns in order to justify its involvement. So let me come to the questions that we receive uh, from our audience. And uh, I think that some of them might be interesting points for discussion. And with the first one, maybe to Bumi. Uh, the question from Jose is about financial barriers to entry. How to address this issue of financial barriers to entry from your perspective and your experience, Bumi? I assume the the individual is asking about financial barriers from a capital perspective. Um, well, you know, there are different instruments of capital for different stages of innovation. Um, you know, venture capital, for example, is not best suited for project finance, just like project finance is not best suited to take technology risk. Um, you know, and so the, the question of the... The, the, the financial barrier ultimately lies in staging an enterprise for the right point in capital recruitment. Um, if you're an early stage uh, technology, you are best suited to seek venture-based or angel-based investments or angel slash venture-based instruments of capital. If you are going to be building a project, um, it's best you seek project financiers and private equity-esque um, modalities of capital. Um, trying to do uh, or mismatching those will automatically present a barrier um, to having um, an enterprise adequately supported. And, and once you're able to figure out the right model, the, the, what I usually encourage entrepreneurs to think about having been one myself, is what is the capital that is necessary for success? And not to be afraid to ask that. Because you have to raise money to get you to a very important value inflection point in which either the markets can be excited about what has been created or new investors can be excited to come in to further support the company. Uh, and so, you know, the capital that is requisite for success is a very important and thoughtful exercise that entrepreneurs have to undertake. Thank you, Bonnie. Uh, next question is from Paul. And I believe that Sokjin might be the best person to answer that. Paul asks us about the role of the local governments beyond the construction uh, of the project. What role local governments can play in maintenance and support of ongoing activities that follow the construction phase? Thank you for the question and thank you, Andre, for the great panelists. Uh, we've learned, I've learned a lot uh, through the discussions. Regarding local governments, I want to go take a step further and say, well, developing nations first, because uh, what we've seen since COVID is that we've, it has proven to us the agility of startups. Uh, for example, pre-COVID, most of the startups, um, because we're talking about local governments, most of the startups, their decision for expansion, either domestic or international, has been always uh, the number one factor has been geographical distance. 
now with COVID and travel restrictions, what we've seen in many of our uh, climate tech, uh, deep tech startups is that distance does not matter. Distance between Seoul and Busan or distance between China and Korea and distance between Korea and uh, Argentina were the same virtually because travel was restricted. What this has changed for us is that we have seen uh, these startups not being limited to, to geographical distance. And this has allowed us to promote uh, and, and to convince basically our deep tech startups to say, look, you can expand anywhere you want. And going back to the issue of local governments, in the case of Korea, uh, there are a lot of uh, policies in place that uh, allows or actually mandates in many cases the adoption of startup or new or as uh, Jay mentioned the disruptive uh, uh, adaptation technologies in climate tech uh, for their public purposes which has allowed these initial entry uh, startups to grow in the local governments first and I think that same logic might apply to developing economies we want to see developing economies focus on promoting and accommodating partnerships we want to see these local Local government, local entities, local startups, local climate entrepreneurs grow up by building an ecosystem. We want to see a sustainable deployment of climate tech solutions. And then we will finally be able to say, look, we've either taken a, a deep tech company with proven technology and entered an untapped market in a developing economy or taking an existing company from a capital region, taking it to a local untapped market, and they will be still attractive for uh, private sector investors. So basically going back to our key topic of this entire conference, uh, World Global Center, I think this is our advice to other governments and other entities as well, is that we need to tap the entrepreneurial energies of these startups, of these new climate technopreneurs uh, to solve the climate uh, finance paradox. And I think it all lies in the uh, focus of policies of governments, of MDBs, and of global leadership institutions like the GCF to say, look, we are here to start and uh, kickstart that initial period, kickstart that synergy through tech transfers and the formation of these collaborative partnerships that I've talked about. Thank you. Thank you, Sergi. And uh, Michael, uh, I think uh, would be the best, uh, Paul would be the best uh, to answer the question from Michael about crowdfunding sourcing solutions for the climate related projects. In your experience, Paul, what would you recommend or saw in your practice as a potential solution from the crowdsourcing perspective? Yeah, great question. There's um, there's a lot of the, the crowdfunding space has evolved quite a bit, and you can crowdfund for equity. You can crowdfund for pre-sales of your products. Um, I I think the model I've seen the model work for early stage, um, kind of seed to Series B or Series A stage. Um, uh, I love Boonmi's comments about you know the importance of an entrepreneur. Uh, for an entrepreneur to really think about the capital requirements for true scale and, um, and, and different kinds of capital come in at different points in a venture's journey. Uh, it seems to me from what I've seen, crowdfunding can be quite effective uh, for, for early stage, uh, for smaller amounts. Um, but uh, again, speaking to the scale of the problems that, uh, that we're addressing with climate solutions, um, uh, I, I think I, I don't think um, crowdfunding can serve that that function for true scale. Thank you, Paul. Um, I believe we have a few minutes, so got a precious time. But I think uh, each of you uh, can have maybe a small wrap up, addressing participants of our conference who are listening us from many parts of the world. So to finalize our panel today, maybe a few words about climate, innovation, technology, and other topics that we are discussed today, addressing the audience of our panel. Over to you, Bumi. Well, thank you, Andre, for such a wonderful uh, session. I want to congratulate you on the panelists that you've brought together. We've all learned a lot uh, in this session. This has been one of the best uh, um, and educational sessions that I've actually been part of. So I want to 
congratulate you on that. And thank you to all the panelists for your very insightful comments. I would say that this is a period of urgency. Um, it is a period of innovation and it's a period of survival. Um, uh, we cannot afford the economic consequences of ina inaction in climate change. And what it requires of everyone is to be thoughtful and innovative. Um, the, 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 the leapfrogging that needs to occur will not happen on incremental technology alone. There is a role for deployment of incremental technology. There's also uh, the, the very important need for all of us to come collectively with our intellectual firepower to solve this problem. Um, it is also a very exciting time to be an innovator. I think there is an increasing awareness um, uh, in the capital markets uh, about the urgency of this problem and the willingness to begin to support these innovative approaches. And so I'm very positive that if you have the right idea, um, you have the right team, that uh, you will find the back end to support that innovation. So this is um, as urgent as this period of time is, there can't be a better time to be an innovator in this period and also particularly to be a climate innovator in this period. So I think that we can look to a period of optimism um, a collective nature uh, can provide the solutions that are necessary um, to create a transformative environment that we all seek. In. Indeed, Bumi. But I would like to emphasize that your thanks goes not to me, but to the great team of the Green Climate Fund behind their organizational machine of this conference, led by our good colleague, Mr. Garrett Held. So big thanks to all of them for their great job, both from technical and organizational perspective. I believe all the panelists uh, will share this gratitude uh, with me equally. Indeed. Now, Indeed. now to Sokjin. Sokjin, please. Thank you, Andre. Uh, we, I think we have a lot of uh, green uh, climate uh, techpreneurs attending and watching us uh, today. And I just wanted to say that with COVID-19, there's no worries because this has actually enabled you, the entrepreneurs, from previously tech mobility and tech movement where you had to actually physically move to another country and expand your business to a tech transfer era. And I think um, the tech transfer and the joint venture facilities or the collaborative partnership facilities that we've talked about, Born to Global Center is here. And I'm sure that GCF also realizes and understands the significance of promoting these collaborative partnerships. And I hope that the entrepreneurs globally will join us in this effort to overcome COVID-19 and, and, and enable these tech transfers to happen globally around. Thank you. Thank you, Sabji. Merrick? Yeah, maybe I'll do a, a quick address to the, the, the other tech entrepreneurs on the, uh, uh, on the line as well. I think one of the things which, you know, I didn't mention uh, during the discussion was the importance um, to continue to listen to the market and your customers as you're developing the, the product. You know, we, we, we initially came with a very uh, specific idea around, around our technology. And as we've taken feedback from our customers and the market, which has evolved over the last you know, 18 to 24 months um, and, and continues to change, it's important that you do not stay rigid on where you started, that you listen to the market, you listen to the customers, and you, you, you develop your product to ensure that it doesn't meet what was required yesterday, but meets what's required today and tomorrow. So, uh, you know, listen to the market while, while you're working hard on all the other things you have to do as a tech entrepreneur. Thank you, Merrick. Paul? Well, first of all, thanks so much to uh, uh, GCF for bringing this together. It's been a joy to, uh, to meet the other panelists as well. And we've had a lot of side conversations. I think there've been a lot of connections made here. So I'm looking forward to seeing where that goes. Um, I think to, to the, uh, the entrepreneurs and the, the, the would-be or aspiring entrepreneurs on the call, I would say this is an historic opportunity 
to, to come forward with solutions. Um, 1,700 uh, jurisdictions around the world, cities, states, provinces, have declared a climate emergency. And they're moving from that declaration to action plans. And they're looking for solutions. Uh, I mentioned before, massive coalitions of global investors with tens of trillions of dollars under management are putting pressure on companies to align their plans to uh, the climate emergency. Um, this creates, and other forces too, from employees and elsewhere, this creates new market demand for practical solutions, adaptation and mitigation solutions. Um, uh, I love what, what Merrick said, think about not just solutions, don't, don't waste your time thinking about solutions for yesterday, think about solutions for today and for tomorrow. Um, focus on creating value. Great companies create value, not only for their customers, but for all the stakeholders that they touch. And that's, that's really the, the future of business. That's what great companies do today. And uh, companies that don't focus on creating value for a wide range of stakeholders are not going to be in business. Thank you, Paul. And Jay. Well, thanks again to everybody. I do think it's uh, been a terrific panel. I've really enjoyed it. And thanks, Andre, for doing a wonderful job of coordinating all these things. Um, I would just say two things. And one is for all the urgency, um, and it is urgent, and all the crisis, and it is a crisis, and all the need for speed, and tempo, tempo, tempo is what we should be focused on here. This is a great opportunity. This is a great opportunity for investors to scale capital in an environment where the investments of yesterday are not gonna perform the same way as they had before. This is a great opportunity for innovators, for the next generation to step forward and not just imagine a future that's almost as good as the past, but a better future. One that has nature-based solutions integrated into it, one where we live in a better engagement with nature and biodiversity, one where we have a more equitable society. And technology is a huge component of that. Right? Electric vehicles, if you had said to anyone 15 years ago, would be a near inevitability. They would have told you they, they were out of your mind and there be, they'll be cleaner, they'll have better health outcomes as a result, it'll change the way that we actually operate our society. And that is just the beginning and one of the few starting points where all of you that are innovators and entrepreneurs that want to change things have a great opportunity and a great challenge to do so. So. The, the cynical part is the piece that I think I've talked about, but the optimist part is really true there. There are sources of capital like Kraft, like Lightsmith, like many others we think that are out there. There are programs like ASAP that if you're an entrepreneur and you want to find the other folks that are trying to do the same things that you are, uh, that you can do so. Programs like Sockchins and others that are out there, folks like BEV that are out there. And the Green Climate Fund could play an enormously powerful role in catalyzing and transforming this environment. But make no mistake, there is a great opportunity for investors here. There's a great opportunity for entrepreneurs here. And there must be, there must be. If we don't imagine a future where there's multi-billion dollar sized companies fighting climate change, we will hope that we had, because that's what we're gonna need. But that's what also the, the promise and opportunity is. The last thing I would say is, I think the GCF 1.0 has been a great start in trying to get Paris moving forward and dramatically mobilizing capital. I think the key here is to make sure that there are instruments in the GCF and processes in the private sector facility and the way we actually look at the path of innovation, which is going forward, which is not going to look the same way that projects of yesteryear look. It's not just going to be project finance opportunities. It's going to be technology. It's going to be entrepreneurship. It's going to be looking for innovation in a pooled way that's not going to look the same as before. So I'd strongly encourage all stakeholders that support the GCF to add to the staff resources of the GCF, particularly the private sector facility, to support massive streamlining so that we can actually engage entrepreneurs and technologists at the time that they need to be engaged. It cannot take two years to get accredited. It cannot take multiple years to actually launch projects. We don't have the time anymore for that. I think the GCF staff is the highest quality that I've encountered. And if you put the tools in their hands, the speed, the technology, the ability to move, that is what this moment in time calls for. We are in multiple crises now, and the way to get out of them is to hold hands and step forward. And so I'd strongly encourage the GCF to take that path of innovation, streamlined activity, and to deliver the opportunity and transformational impact that it can, and I think it can. 
So that's my last word. Thank you, Jay. Dear panel participants and members of the audience, thank you for your time dedicated to our session on climate innovation and technology transfer. I feel that our experience and first-hand knowledge of dealing with innovation implementation challenges that we shared today, though not only a bunch of entertaining stories, but also a good guidance for those entrepreneurs and climate activists that may follow our path and help our joint efforts to advance economic development along the low emission and sustainable pathways. I believe this is a truly noble cause that even at this virtual event really unites our hearts and minds despite thousand miles of physical distance, different countries that we are from and diversity of character of each of us. And I hope we will keep this great, great feeling of unity like cherished memories of other important moments of our lives for the sake of doing better things every day in the real world. With that, thank you all once again and over to Javier for closing remarks. Dear participants, colleagues and friends from around the world, we have now reached the end of the third annual GCF Private Investment for Climate Conference, GPIC. And it is my privilege and honor to bid farewell to what has been an extremely stimulated and insightful discussion over three days. This event has gathered more than 3,000 participants from both the public and private sector, including project developers, institutional investors, financial investors, and public policy leaders. All live recordings of our discussions already have or will be uploaded to the JPIC website within a day. And these recordings can be accessed on web or web app for the next 90 days. This year's conference has been placed strong emphasis on how we unlock the opportunities provided for climate investment in emerging in developing countries. COVID-19 has made the need for green investment even more pressing. And by doing so, we can boost economic recovery whilst also accelerating the transition to a low carbon resilient economy. During the first day on the session number one, greener, smarter, fairer, mobilizing leadership for a low carbon and climate resilient recovery. Global leaders highlighted the need of green investments to help developing countries recover from the COVID recession and meet the climate challenge. The GCF's working paper set out six priority actions to scale up climate finance in the era of COVID-19 including leveraging NDCs for policy integration, developing new valuation mechanism to accelerate asset repricing and make blended finance work for nascent markets. Christiana Figueres called for bold financial instruments such as debt swaps for climate to provide debt relief for developing countries coupled with simultaneous incentive for climate action. Joseph Stiglitz stressed that green investments are timely, labor intensive, targeted, they have large multipliers and therefore should be a central part of the recovery packages. Muliani Indrawati noted that the implementation of green recovery will be the driver for the world's economic transformation. Yannick Glemarek mentioned that COVID-19 pandemic has brought us to either a tipping point or a turning point in our fight against climate change. On session number two, 
aligning investors portfolio with 1.5 degree. Right now is the time to commit private and institutional funds where it's needed. This session invited some of the world's leading private and institutional investors with a combined total of over 30 trillion in assets under management to discuss why now is the time to align investors portfolio with the 1.5. There is increasing alignment among investors. For example, JP Morgan, HSBC, Otemasek made bold commitments on getting to net zero by 2050, supporting their clients aligning with the Paris goals and advocating for market solutions, market-based solutions, including a price on carbon and the commercialization of new technologies to support decarbonization. Ladies and gentlemen, the trend is away from shareholderism and it is moving more and more towards stakeholderism, further empowering environmental, social and governance criteria, ESG. What is different to the last 10 years? More and more clients are now keen to make this transition due to the heightened risk perception and changes in the regulatory environment, especially with respect to disclosure requirements, clear taxonomies, and the development of stress testing exercises by central banks and financial regulators. Institutional investors are keen to invest in sustainable infrastructure, which can offer stable long-term returns despite the difficulties to verify in several locations which assets are genuinely sustainable. We develop a consistent, globally applicable labeling system for investments, the finance to accelerate the sustainable transition infrastructure, the FAST Infra initiative is under development. We move then to day two, Day number two and session number three, navigating the energy transition, maintaining and accelerating momentum in a post-COVID-19 environment. In light of the heightened risk aversion and capital scarcity induced by COVID-19, catalytic funding for energy transition investments is more important now than ever. We're going through a global energy transformation. And emerging markets like India are at the forefront of it. Public and private sectors are jointly developing infrastructure and integration of e-mobility, renewable energy, and artificial intelligence is important for a revolution to happen. The key is affordability and scale. Renewable energy investments have accelerated due to COVID as projects are not only good for the environment, but also make economic sense. Misalignment and mistrust, regulatory uncertainties, perceived versus actual risk, lack of capacity, lack of patient capital for private developers, as well as access to finance remain key challenges in some markets. E-mobility is an ancient market with exponential growth potential over the next five years. GCF concessionality can help address the constraints and risk in the sector. GCF can facilitate rapid scale up of EVs and catalyze private sector investment flows. To ensure a just transition, existing expertise and capabilities must be repurposed, must be retrained and upscaled for jobs from old industries to transfer to new industries. Then we move to session four on day two, investing in nature. How can we get nature on the private investment agenda for a green recovery? The nature-based solution session brought together industry champions from finance, corporations, 
and investors to drive practical action to finance nature as a key investable asset class for tackling climate change and to build back better. The session kicked off with a discussion on the key global trends in nature-based solutions with highlights the strong linkage between economic growth and environment, as well as the mismatch between the ambition of the private sector and their ability to deploy capital. Changes are occurring now in the banking system to sustain the business that are anchored in nature-based solutions. We need to take a long-term perspective to foster the transition to sustainable development. The oceans seem to be an undervalued asset compared to conservation efforts around other land-based natural capital. Investors can help improve the health of our oceans while promoting marine focused investments. The financing gap needs to be filled for a real deforestation free commodity production. With the right risk management tools, it is possible to achieve impact and reasonable returns. With that, we move to today, day three. In session number five, we saw catalyzing market mechanisms, carbon pricing as a tool to finance the green and just recovery. The panel, the panel discussed the current state barriers and opportunities for carbon pricing instrument as a tool to support climate action, to support build resilience and catalyze private investments at scale. Despite the underlying momentum towards an expansion in the use of carbon pricing tools, the COVID-19 crisis has caused some disruption to this dynamic. The delay in negotiations around Article 6 of the Paris Agreement is one such example. Whilst the full repercussions of COVID-19 on the international effort to curve greenhouse gas emissions will not be known for quite some time, it is expected that the global expansion of carbon pricing initiatives will continue and the currently fragmented modalities and geographical and sectoral coverage will be further aligned. Careful implementation of carbon pricing in combination with reductions in fossil fuel subsidies offer an opportunity and effective approach to support a green and just recovery in many developing countries. The GCF is taking an active role in developing catalytic projects that contribute to the expansion and maturing of carbon market mechanism. The last session, the session number six, the breakthrough climate innovations and the role of technology transfer for developing countries. Uh, global recessionary tendencies related to the COVID-19 pandemic are a risk factor for businesses, no doubt. On the contrary, a well-managed green resilient recovery is a big chance for upcoming innovative technologies. Panelist Insights pointed out the great impact potential as well as challenges of capital flows into breakthrough climate technologies in both fields of mitigation and adaptation. Here, the GCF can play a key role in the risking and catalyzing private early stage investments. Successful public-private partnerships are decisive for creating an enabling environment for rapid and widespread technology transfer of groundbreaking climate innovations to the benefit of emerging countries. There was a common consensus at this uh, fantastic session that this is a great, a unique opportunity for innovators with the purposed investment of creating value for all stakeholders. 
Finally, dear participants, uh, dear colleagues and friends, on behalf of the Green Climate Fund, I would like to thank their excellencies, the president and minister, the heads of international organizations, the business leaders of national and global financial institutions, GCF partners and climate thought leaders, and all other speakers and panel members. Your presence has been invaluable and without any doubt has helped make this year's conference a great success. We're also very grateful to all those who have been involved in the organization of the event, in particular my friends and my colleagues from the DCF private sector facility, from the events management unit, ICT staff, as well as the partnership and communication colleagues, and the team of interpreters uh, who provided the real opportunity of enhancing this year's event with the engagement on a global scale. Your work has been outstanding and your time and effort in organizing this conference despite the difficult circumstances this year is much appreciated. Ladies and gentlemen, since the GCF Private Investment for Climate Conference is an annual event, we look forward to seeing you again in 2021, when we shall reconvene to take up the climate action agenda ahead of COP26. Very many thanks to all of you. Bye-bye.